What I know is that that lake has strong spiritual powers. Buo mrakije natoku charingetoku famyang. What is going on? This is a portal. There's a rabbit hole that we're going down. We it can't be stopped. What is this? But I then. What is this? Yo ya no estaba no estaba de carne. Estaba como un espíritu. That little heart-shaped lake up there is the center point of the world. In 1971, Sergio Loesa, a Costa Rican government mapping photographer, captured what would become one of the most compelling pieces of UFO evidence that exists today. The photograph was taken above the serene and mysterious Lake Cote. This famous photograph shows a metallic disc-shaped object emerging from or diving into the lake. It was taken during an official aerial survey for the National Geographic Institute of Costa Rica. The photo has been scrutinized by several researchers, photo analysts, and ufologists over the years, and their collective conclusion showed that the photograph is in fact real and untampered with. The analyses concluded that the object was not a conventional aircraft, bird, or cloud formation, but researchers could not definitively identify the object, leading to continued speculation about its origin and nature. A true unidentified flying object or unidentified anomalous phenomena, according to the current terminology. Even the local Maleku tribe have long considered Lago Cote a spiritual site and a portal to alternate dimensions. The Maleku hold many stories about magical occurrences, UAP sightings, and encounters with otherworldly beings at the lake. We will hear more about these stories soon from Chayu Chayu, a shaman of the Maleku who will be guiding us through a traditional ceremony designed to open up the alleged interdimensional portal at Lago Cote. But more on that later. I've been to Costa Rica six times now, and I somehow never heard about the Lake Cote UAP legend until my friend JP, who lives in the area, told me about it. Yeah, it seems to be like it's a, one of the most beautiful places in the world, and it seems like it's very empty there. We decided to investigate what was going on there. Our adventure started unexpectedly one evening when we went out to the lake to get some drone footage, but we had no idea what we were about to discover that very night. Last night before sunset, we went out to get drone shots of Lago Cote. That's it, we just went out to get some drone footage. And then, little did we know we would be going down a complete rabbit hole of investigation, uncovering clue after clue. We're driving around the lake and we think, why don't we just see if these people who own land here are home and we can ask them what they know. So we're gonna pass by the house, the one house on this lake. Let's check it out. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Oh my God. Okay, so there's clearly no one here there's no cars, and if they lived here, they would have to have a car, right? Is it just me, or is it sketchy here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty spooky. I mean, there's not many people who live on this mysterious lake. There's a lot of plots of land for sale, and they've been out for many years, but it seems like nobody want, is buying it. This is where things get weird and feels like there's some type of weird portal opening, because none of this was planned. So then we're in Nuevo Arenal, and JP says he needs to go to the bank. He has to get cash out. So we start driving to the ATM. But it turns out right next to the bank, there's an alien themed restaurant. This restaurant is fully decked out in alien themed decorations. There's aliens everywhere. There's UFOs. There's all these signs. It even says free Julian Assange on the, on the door. Okay, well, they must know something since they have an alien themed restaurant. Little did we know when we walked into that restaurant what we were going to discover. We walk in and there's this sweet little old woman who's the running the place and we, we talk to her. It turns out she's the owner named Emmy. And at first she's starting to tell us like general information about the lake and the UFO sighting, and she pulls out the famous 1971 photograph, but then she starts going into this whole crazy story about her husband who has 
an abduction story. In uh, 71, my husband was in Turin. My husband is Italian. He speak to me about this just a few years ago. Really? Yeah. He, he started to tell me, can I tell you something very private? Of course, I'm here. Why? Emmy also showed us videos that she herself took in her backyard that are the craziest UFO videos. What is this? But I, dead. What is this? Dead. What is this? You can hear the dog, my dog barking. What is this? Oh, Wait, did, did you take this? Yeah, it's the same video. Where did you take but it? Then in my your backyard? husband say, you know what they, they look like? Like the light that you was seeing, that you see in the picture, that yeah. you have from the flying sources. So they look like this, but you see they were oh moving. Oh my god. They're not moving. This is it's like crazy. We need to come back or something. And I gotta talk to the husband. I mean, I have to talk to this. After hearing Emmy's stories, we were dying to talk to her husband, David. But she told us that he typically doesn't like talking about it. Emmy told us that she would ask him and let us know if we could come back the next day for an interview. It just got trippier and trippier. So we are going to hopefully go back to talk to her husband and find out the full story. The following day, while we were waiting for her to respond, JP asked his friend Lane, who lives in the area, if he had any stories himself. And this is what he said. I know all about the aliens, bro. So we're gonna go see Lane today? Yeah, let's do it. Why did you move here? We first moved to Costa Rica, we moved to the beach um, right before Corona, and we just wanted to get out of the United States and have a child raised down here. Then we decided to leave the beach. We wanted we went to our friend's property and I had something similar like this and we asked him, you know, we want what you have. We want a closed loop organic farm that produces all its own food and we want this. And so he steered us to this property through a bufo shaman actually. He used to be the old owner of this property and had let it go wild for 14 years and we just came here and immediately the emotion was strong. Yes. I've had multiple experiences here with Sightings. The couch is here. And I was sitting on the couch at night. And this is us looking up out there. No, it sounded like a swarm of bees, and that's what caught my attention. So I was sitting here. I looked out that way because I thought there was like a big swarm of bees, but it was like super intense and loud. And it was probably even cloudier and mistier than this and nighttime. So you could see the gray clouds wisping across. Then just flash green. The entire cloud was green. It looked like multiple lightning bolts, but green lightning bolts in the cloud. And then progressively just boom, 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 three times, four times, further distance that way. Had you ever seen anything like that before? I've seen a different UFO that was like a triangle of lights pulsating in and smaller and bigger in Northern California, but not that green. So tell me about what you know. What I know is that that lake has strong spiritual powers and I've seen it manifest itself even in just people moving here. The energy of that lake can be too much and can chase certain people away that aren't ready for it. Like a few tours go up there, it's pristine, beautiful jungle wilderness. You'd expect some tourism up there. It keeps people at a distance. Why? To protect it. What do you I think? think what do you think the protection is coming from? Aliens. <laughs> so, yeah. My personal belief would be that aliens are us more evolved in the future coming back and helping us along the way, and they'll come to people when people are ready, not when people want to see them. Is there a connection between why you felt called here and the energy of the lake? I believe 100%. I mean, I moved, my my entrance is right across from the entrance up there. It's, it's, it's for a reason. I can't tell you why or what, but I know that this is where I'm supposed to be. Have you heard of the messages from the aliens um, that people report in many different cases that we need to protect the Earth? That's, well, I think that's, I've heard that from multiple people about these spirits and these aliens too, specifically at Lake Cote. And I, I view this as the, and the, what the Malayku have viewed as is the navel of the world. That little heart-shaped lake up there is the center point of the world and its health and its birth and its rebirth. I believe that Maybe there'll be climate change, stuff like that. This is the most stable place I could have chosen in the world. So, 
I just got a message from Emmy. David, it's available this afternoon, like after two. Can you believe this? We actually found a person who was abducted by aliens and he's really afraid to talk about this. And out of all people, he actually consented and he's gonna talk to us. Can you imagine what kind of information he will share with us? This photo was taken right there across the street. Did you take this photo? You took no, the, no. You took this one? No, this is a neighbor shared to me. When the sun go down, it was sitting in the front of the lake and he started to see a light in the mountain. So the, then the light was going down, down, down and was going in the lake. Mm. Was a big light, like, 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 a, like a flying source under the water because it was a light like moving. Wow. We hold this here. So, so Emmy is going to share her amazing food with us. We're going to have a meal. Talk to David and then we'll do an official interview to hear his story. Okay, perfect. When we met David, I could tell he was a little bit nervous. But after having a delicious Italian meal, he sat down to share his story with us. Yo estaba en Turín, era el 1970-71, no me acuerdo bien. Y me fui a, a dormir. A un cierto punto de la noche, me vino como una corriente eléctrica aquí. Y yo estaba como paralizado. No podía moverme. Y me acuerdo que dije, estaba llamando, mamá, mamá. Y vino como una luz azul, otra vez, muy fuerte. La ventana estaba cerrada. Y había una cortina cerrada. Algo me transportó afuera. Yo ya no estaba, no estaba de carne, estaba como un espíritu. Me encontré adentro de una estructura muy... parecía como una clínica, digamos así. Eh, solo me metieron en una cama, me pusieron una camiseta, era muy pesada, y no podía moverme. Yo no era aterrorizado, no tenía miedo. Eran muy altos. Estaban como gente nórdica, como... Muy lindo. Y le pregunté, ¿quién son ustedes? ¿De dónde viene? Y él me dijeron, ahora no podemos decirte. Usted se acordará de nosotros entre 40, 50 años. Esto me dijeron, quédese quieto, no se asuste. Nada malo te va a pasar. Ellos empezaron a volar. Podía asomarme a un, a un obló con una ventanita redonda y empecé a ver una calle de montaña, vacas corrobadas. Pasamos arriba de un volcán y una laguna. E ellos me dijeron, ahora te regresamos a la casa. Yo cuando regresé me encontré otra vez en, la, en el cuarto de mi casa y tuve otra crisis epiléptica muy fuerte me dijeron una cosa no confiar no confiar en las en eh, las naves triangular yeah, they are very bad pero este no es triangular no siempre acostumbraba a ir con una camarita fotográfica Kodak de la corriente yo tenía muchas fotos en el rollo sí. Kodak Sí. Pero todas estaban quemadas en blanco, menos esta. ¿Es esto tú? Sí. Este es ti. Este es él. ¿Recuerdas que tomaste? Cuando era guapo. ¿Recuerdas que tomaste? Cuando era guapo. ¿Recuerdas que tomaste? ¿Te recuerdas cuando tomaste esta foto? No. Ellos me dijeron: Te dejamos una prueba. Eh, que cuando vine aquí en el 89, 1989, la, el primer lugar que quería visitar venía como la laguna de Cote, el Arenal, Nuevo Arenal. Y cuando entramos con, con el carro de Tilarán hacia, hacia aquí, yo tuve como un déjà vu. Estaba diciendo, pero ah, yo conozco ese lugar. 
donde un señor estaba vendiendo una finca, un, una tierra, que ahora hay un hotel. El dueño de la finca me dijo, usted no sabe que aquí hace años pasó un, un platillo volador enorme que alumbró toda la zona y la laguna y después se fue. Lo importante es entender que no estamos solos. Ok, we are finished. Ok, thank you. Although we had many more questions for David, it was clear that he was done talking. So we said our goodbyes still a bit in disbelief of what he had shared. Right now we are on our way to pick up Chayu, who is JP's friend, and he is a local shaman from the Maleku tribe, which is Costa Rica's smallest indigenous community. He is responsible for sharing a lot of their traditions and a lot of their wisdom. There's only 600 people left in Costa Rica that speak the Maleku language, so there's only a few of them left who really hold this heritage and are sharing it with us. So the Maleku have all these legends about Lekote, and it's known to be a spiritual site to them. They've done ceremony there, for years and years, and Chayu's going to take us there and tell us more about what he knows, and he's going to guide us through a ceremony to essentially open the portal and make contact. Today we have picked up Chayu Chayu. Chayu Chayu. Hola. <laughs> ahora, ahora va, va, va a ser muy bueno la ceremonia. Espero que lo disfruten porque es una ceremonia única, y ustedes van a tener ese gran privilegio que un indígena nativo de Costa Rica que le va a hacer una ceremonia especial a ustedes. Weather is not looking good. Weather is not looking good at all. So, we're at the lake and it's pouring rain and when you look out, it's just straight fog, like you can't see anything. It's so spooky. Ah! <laughs> like please can can it just stop raining? Aliens, please, we, we wanted to connect with you and we need the sun to come out. Repitan conmigo. Okay. Kahuifa Marama. Kahuifa Manan. Afepakian. Afepakian. Purani. Purani. Jahana. Jahana. Niko. Niko. Umuti. Umuti. ¿Qué es esto? Permiso. Permiso, porque mañana vamos a hacer una ceremonia especial. Yo pienso que la naturaleza nos va a recompensar hoy para poder hacer esa ceremonia. Okay, we just got to the lake. It looks like we have a short window potentially where there won't be rain and we can do our ceremony. I just feel really honored and grateful that Chayu was willing to come back to share this with us. It's really important to show and share and honor the indigenous um, beliefs and customs and ceremony and to make sure that that is very present because this is a place that is sacred to them and he is willing to really share it with us through his traditions and ceremonial practices. So we're really blessed to have this opportunity. The weather is definitely adding to the spookiness of this. It's like the wind is whipping and the fog is over the mountains. But yesterday we couldn't even see the lake through the fog. So at least today we, we can see it. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling ready. <laughs> Yo ocupo pedirle primero a los espíritus okay. para que se activen y que nos dé permiso todo lo que vamos a hacer en el día de hoy. Puo mraquille natoku charinetoku famian. Afepakian purani ni comiune ni cote chariliacac. El lago Coter para los indígenas maleku significa para nosotros poder contactarnos, hablar con los espíritus que no lo vemos y sentir la energía todo de los espíritus. En la cultura maleku nosotros creemos y lo creemos firmemente 
que el gran jefe, el gran cacique, está adentro del lago Cotter. El gran jefe y el gran cacique fue uno de los primeros seres humanos que vivió en la cultura o la tribu maleco. Los maleco, los indígenas, um, los uh, abuelos o abuelas tienen historia. Eh, sí, tenemos personas que conocen mucho de ella, pero ellos son personas que no van a hablar de ella. Ellos son muy, muy conserva, eh, lo conservan mucho poder hablar de los espíritus como el extraterrestre. Puo toku charin etoku famian. Takaniko yahanan eniko kote chariliakako niyu paunka kuere hamara. Marama. Purani. Purani. Nikona. Nikona. Umuti. Umuti. Milaje. Milaje. Chachafa. Chachafa. Naptei. Naptei. Niko. Niko. Yahana. Yahana. Kote. Kote. Chariliaka. Chariliaka. Natoyeha. Natoyeha. Inanatueka. Inanatueka. Natoye. Natoye. Y ya casi llueve. It's time for us to go. Okay. What do you feel? I feel this is just the beginning. <laughs> well, you live here, so you have many <laughs> opportunities <laughs> to see some UFOs. Chayu Chayu said it's time to go, <laughs> so we're gonna go. I'm just so happy the weather held up for us. Although sharing this sacred ceremony with Chayu Chayu was really special, I couldn't help but feel disappointed that nothing exciting happened. Interestingly, the rain began to start again as soon as we got up to leave, just as Chayu Chayu had predicted. So we left, feeling unsatisfied that no portal seemed to open. The next day, I woke up to a text from Emmy that relayed a message from David. This is what it said. Emmy messaged us and said that David, her husband, said that we have the right energy to make contact. And he told us to repeat a mantra called Fara Om over and over to keep repeating that and we would make contact. And I have no idea what that means. I don't want to just go around repeating a mantra not knowing what it means. But apparently that's what we're supposed to do to make contact. So. I want something to happen, I want to see some shit, come on, I don't want to just hear people's stories. Like, show me, show me you're real, aliens, if you're really out there, come on, like, give us something to work with. So, we're gonna be like crazy people and get in the lake, and we're gonna chant a mantra that David told us to chant. I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> Pharaoh on, Pharaoh on, Pharaoh on, Pharaoh on. He also said that we need to be in a calm state, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna have to get it together. I'm gonna have to get it together. We can't not go in the lake. We've come this far, we have to fulfill what we came here to do. Oh, I really just am dreading this. I really don't want to get in this lake. It's pulling me, it's like, come into the lake, please, child. We're about to do this. We're about to 
Let's do a prayer. All right. Great beings of Lago Cote, extraterrestrials, gods, spirits of this lake, show yourselves. We're coming into your lake to offer ourselves in peace. Fatter on, fatter on, fatter on. So it's been a few weeks now since my experience at Lago Cote and I really want to talk about my honest thoughts after having some time to like marinate on this and reflect on it. I honestly feel like something very spooky is happening at that lake. That photograph from 1971 is such a rare documented occurrence of ufos and we don't often get to see photographic evidence like that that has been proven to be real and untampered with and a credible photo especially because it was taken from the costa rican government at the time on an official aerial survey i feel like that's just very spooky that that photo exists and there has to be something going on at this lake because not only is that photo evidence available but the Maleku legends of the lake and their relationship to that lake specifically is also very interesting. So I've researched this topic for many years now. I've made many videos about this. And one thing that consistently comes up is the connection to the indigenous wisdom and cultures. At almost every single UFO hotspot that I have researched, there's some type of indigenous legend about the area and some type of connection to the indigenous communities and their beliefs about these places. Sedona, Arizona is one example. In the Berkshires, where I made my last documentary called Abduction, there is a whole story about the local indigenous communities and kind of the curse on the land from King Philip's War. I mean, there's always like these, these interesting connection. So I think that's something to continue to pay attention to. What really has me tripped up is David's story. I really am having a hard time knowing what to believe. And on the one hand, I really want to fully believe him. And there's part of me that thinks, is he just making this up or is he just crazy? Maybe he's doing this to get more attention to their restaurants. I don't know. I feel like I really want to believe him. And it's also a very big pattern and theme with a lot of people with abduction stories that they do feel very uncomfortable and hesitant talking about it because of the ridicule that they receive. And David definitely felt that type of discomfort and hesitation to talk to us. But I also feel like he was willing to because he could feel that we cared to actually listen to his story and not judge him. And I think that's really important is to just listen with an open heart and open mind and curiosity. And then you can make a decision from there rather than going in with judgment and having your mind already made up. And there are many similarities that David experienced to what a lot of other people who have abduction stories also say happened to them. The one thing I really need to mention that has happened since this experience is that I kind of went back and analyzed some of the photos and videos that Emmy shared with me and I just am unsure if they are fabricated. There's one video that she showed me that when it gets to a certain part of the video it, it switches to selfie mode and I can see these two lights that kind of look like flying saucers in the air that originally really shocked me but then when I looked closer I could see that this was just her face and that these were her eyes and there was some type of like effect or something that was put on it and I don't know if she was trying to manipulate these videos to make it seem like they were something more. I don't want to assume that's what it was but I have a hard time now fully believing 
what she shared. Maybe this was all a big stunt to get more people to the UFO restaurant. I don't know. Although I am disappointed nothing exciting happened, I think it makes sense because I was trying to film and it was raining and it was very hard to get into like a calm meditative state, which I feel like is very important if you're trying to channel anything. I think it's one of the most critical pieces of this is that you are able to enter into a trance-like state and go into deep ceremony and prayer. And we just weren't able to do that because of the weather. And I just feel like it wasn't the right timing. And as Lane said, you will get visited and you will make contact when you're ready for it, not necessarily when you want to and when you're looking for it. I feel like these things happen really when you're least expecting it and so I think that for me I had this desire to make contact but it's not going to happen when I'm wanting to or forcing it it's going to happen when it's the right time and probably when I'm not expecting it. <laughs> the topic of UAPs and extraterrestrials is so layered and nuanced and there's so much to unpack and uncover here so if you're wanting me to make more videos about this please let me know in the comments and let me know your honest thoughts on this video. And if you're really interested in this topic and you want to chat more about it, we have the Vibe Tribe Discord where we talk about a lot of the different topics I cover on this channel, including ex extraterrestrials and interdimensionals and all the fun things. So come hang out with us there. I'll add a link in the video description. That's it for this episode of Skylife. I love you all so much and the adventure continues.